Hello students, welcome to uh, day five lecture where we're going to talk a little bit about what theories are and evidences for evolution. So to start off this day, what I was thinking is perhaps we could assume that there are two competing explanations for the diversity of life. Um, I realize there could be lots of other explanations that maybe people have come up with, but we're going to use these two and um, Hopefully this helps us with a discussion today of evidences for evolution, what theories are. So the first possible explanation is evolutionary theory. And this basically says that all organisms share a common ancestor, that these organisms have changed over time due to selective pressures in the environment that would select one variant over another and allow them to pass on their genes. So evolutionary theory and evolution of itself is both kind of a verb and a noun. It's, it's the process of changing a little bit generation after generation and it's also the outcome, the fact that there are organisms that are related to one another from common ancestors. Um, perhaps another possibility, and even though I'm using the word theory here, really what I mean is another possibility is perhaps the literal creationists um, explanation for the diversity of life. And if you're not familiar with this, this is kind of the you know, Judeo-Christian story that all organisms were created by a divine being in the presence, pre precise state in which they exist today, and that this creative period took seven days and proceeded in the order outlined in the Bible, right? Okay. So again, we're just, we're just using these two as an example to kind of move through how we might um, come up with, a, with an idea or with, with a a proposal for what is the best explanation to, to explain the diversity of life on the planet. So what we're going to do is go through different evidences or different phenomena that we observe in nature. We're not going to be exhaustive, we're just going to do a few. And we're going to basically ask the question, is, it, is this better explained by evolutionary theory or explained by, you know, the creationist um, idea? So the first um, thing that we'll look at is what's, what we're going to call homology. But I want you to look at the three different skeletons here. We have a human, a bat, and a whale. And what do we notice? Well, we notice that if you start to count bones, so for example, there's a humerus in the forelimb of ours. That's, that's this bone right here, right? Then the ulna and the radius, and you always know that the radius is the one on the side of your thumb because it radiates radiates around the other bone. And then you have, you know, a bunch of small bones called carpals and then metacarpals and the phalanges, right, leading out to the digits. Well, if we look at a bat, we actually see, even though it's very different in its kind of, if you look at it, you know, with the, with the skin and the fur on, but if you break it down to the bones, you can actually see that there is a humerus, a radius, and an ulna, even though the ulna is quite rudiment, rudimentary. And then you have a bunch of little bones, and then you have metacarpals and phalanges. So you have, you know, a bunch of bones leading to kind of these digits that extend outwards. And even if we look at something like a whale, right, the flipper on a whale, you see one bone, a humerus. You see a two bones, a bunch of smaller bones, and then digits coming outward, these phalanges. So even though humans, bats, and whales look very different in their forelimb, there's some similarity there. And similarity due to common ancestry is what we call homology. That means that the humerus in each of those organisms is homologous because it's similar due to common ancestry because the common ancestor of all of those organisms had that structure. Now, Otherwise, uh, th this then becomes, uh, why, how do we explain the fact that all of these organisms have this same, the same, um, you know, structure where you go one bone, two bones, small bones, digits? Well, the best explanation is evolution. Um, within the other alternative explanation, you know, perhaps that's the way that deity decided each one of those need to look at, but there's not a real good reason for why it's that way. So let's look at a different idea. This is uh, looking at ge the geologic column and looking at fossils that are found in earlier 
um, layers of the geologic column compared to older layers. And as we do this, we see that, and you know, the geologists have divided this up into like a Precambrian, Cambrian, all of these different, they've given names to these different um, ages, right? That these different um, layers of rock were laid down, or these depositions were laid down. And what you see is that earlier forms of life are found in the lower layers of rock, and more recent layer um, forms of life are found in the more in the upper layers. And this is what um, is called the law of superposition in geology. Um, this makes sense in terms of evolution because we would expect older things to be in lower layers and more recent fossils to be in more higher layers. This does not support very well the idea of the creationist theory where everything was created all at once or even the idea of the flood where where things were, uh, you know, died all at once and then somehow had to have then um, been saved and arisen. So when you look at the evidences like this, you start to be able to tease out which of the uh, theories are best supported. Specifically, you could also look at just two examples and say, okay, Archaeopteryx is dated at about 150 million years ago. And Homo ergaster, a hominid fossil, is dated at about 1.8 million years ago. If indeed all organisms were created at the exact same time, these two fossils should be found and be dated at the exact same time period, but that's not the case. And the dating of fossils, we're not going to go into that in detail, but it's very robust. It's a very sound science, and um, it's a very consistent and a way of, of dating different fossils that are found in different layers of rocks. So once again, evolutionary theory is better supported by or better explains these types of evidences that we see in the fossil record. Another um, observation we can make about life is that all of life uses the same universal genetic code. Now, we're going to learn about this later on in the semester, but what this means is that our DNA, which has the letters A, C, G, and T, right, those four letters, make are the recipe to make everything that is in a body, proteins and other things. And that recipe is the same. The, the way that that recipe is translated to make proteins is the same for all organisms on the planet. I mean, with just a few exceptions, but that's just an amazing um, universality that's found. And of course, what is one of the best explanations for this universality? Well, it's that all of life share common ancestry, and, that, and so therefore that common ancestral genetic code has been perpetuated through all lineages of the diversity of life. So we're, furthermore, just to, just to highlight this, this DNA, which is also found in all of life. All of life has DNA. Um, and DNA has the four nucleotides, A's, G's, C's, and T's. And it's amazing how DNA is this double-stranded helix molecule that's then wound up on itself. It's wound up even more. Um, and you can continue to look at this, and we've been able to take even pictures of DNA until you get up to a, a chromosome when it's all tightly wound up right before the cell is ready to divide, and then you have a chromosome. And all of life shares DNA. And what's the best explanation for that? Evolutionary theory. Here, for example, is even a human karyotype where you can take each of those chromosomes and you can put them, line them up 1 through 22, and then the X and the Y. So here we're looking at a male. And notice that the Y chromosome is about third the size of the X chromosome. We're going to learn a lot more about DNA and um, how all of cells divide and all of this later on in the semester as well. We just wanted to introduce this idea as in powerful evidence for evolution because all of life shares DNA and shares the same genetic code. Another interesting evidence that we can look at is vestigial structures. For example, um, even in humans, we have hair. We have hair all over our body. And when we are uh, scared or excited with adrenaline, our hair stands on its end, right? Or when we get cold, uh, the hair stands up on its end and we get goosebumps. Um, that is a vestigial response 
to that occurs in other mammals. When other mammals are excited, they have an adrenaline response, or if they're cold, their hairs stand on their end. And by doing that, for example, in cold environments, it allows kind of an isolation of cold air on the outside. The hair uh, provides some um, isolation of that cold air from the body, and so it keeps the animal warm. And we still have these same types of responses in our bodies, even though we don't, we're not covered with fur, we're just covered with little tiny hairs. The appendix. Um, in other organisms, there are additional structures that have sense and, and have purpose within their bodies, but the appendix really doesn't have much of a purpose in the human body. And in fact, sometimes it causes problems and you can get an inflamed appendix and then you have appendicitis and people die from this, right? Uh, the tailbone that is found in humans. Why do we have a tailbone if we don't have a tail, right? Well, these are all called vestigial structures. And vestigial structures are structures that once existed in ancestral forms, but as evolution has proceeded and, and these organisms have diverged and diverged and diverged, those structures have, have no longer become needed, but they're still kind of there, in a, but in a vestigial form or in a reduced form. And there are many of these present in lots and lots of organisms. Even this one right here on the uh, bottom left are, is an example of the pelvis from a whale, and, and this whales don't have right hind limbs, but inside of the blubber, inside of the animal, you can still go into some whales, and they'll still have their pelvic girdles with even tiny little uh, um, hind limbs here, so like the little legs are still kind of sticking there. There's no digits or anything else, but kind of the, the femur, the what's left of the femur is still is still there as, as part of the structure. So vestigial structures, how do we explain those? Well, the best explanation is evolution, once again, that these are leftover, like evolutionary baggage that's still there. In a creationist uh, um, um, explanation, there's really not a good reason for why the Creator would create these essentially mistakes or these left, these unnecessary structures that are still there. Um, Atavisms are things also that are similar to this that are left over, and here's an example of a, an additional nipple that is found along the milk line of humans. Or in this case, this baby, um, during its development, continued to grow the tail, and the tail did not stop off, stop off and just be a little tailbone, but it continued to grow as a tail. And these are called atavisms. Another piece of evidence we can look at is embryonic development. As we look at different organisms in their early embryonic stages, we see that they have very similar structures, right? So here's a human, a chicken, a mouse, a dolphin, a cat, and a turtle, and they all have very similar evolutionary um, morphologies at these early stages. For example, even humans have a post-anal tail, as do you know, the, a mouse, a cat, a turtle, and a dolphin. Um, there are these gill slits that humans have and that all other organisms have. and So there's multiple different similarities in early embryonic developmental stages and that as the organism progresses through those stages they start to change and change and change and change until eventually they look like the you know a, a human baby or a chicken or a mouse. And there's a really famous statement that was once said that that if you actually watch the development of organisms, you in a sense can kind of see the history of the evolutionary um, stages of that organism. It's called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, and those are some complicated words that we'll maybe learn more about, but it simply just says that the development retells the story of evolutionary um, change over time. So. When you look at this, the best explanation for this, again, evolutionary theory. Uh, creationist theory doesn't really have a good explanation for these types of evidences. So now let's refer to the age of the Earth. Of course, in the creationist account, it talks about a really young Earth, you know, no more than 10,000 years old. 
And the Earth is actually really old. Um, we have really good evidence for this, uh, of it being a really old Earth, about four and a half billion years old. I want to watch this close, this uh, quick video, because it kind of, I think, puts in perspective how old the Earth is and how young um, some forms of life are on this planet, including us. The Earth is really old. If you take the entire history of the Earth from 4.6 billion years ago, to the present, and to call that an hour. The first 50 minutes are largely spent in a world of microbes, single-celled organisms. Animal life appeared in the last 10 minutes of that hour. All of human history, our civilization, our evolution, happened in the last hundredth of a second of that hour. So I think that's pretty amazing, right, that all of human history occurred just in that last second, right, <laughs> of, that, of that hour of the age of the Earth, if you, if you do that comparison. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so we've been using this word theory, right, and there's other words in science that we're going to learn more about, like fact and observation and law. Um, but we want to focus on theory today because theory is a really misunderstood word. In fact, evolution and theory sometimes are, are used in this sense. They say, well, oh, some, some people who are distractors of evolution say, oh, evolution is just a theory. Somehow trying to give it a connotation that theory means just this simple guess. But I want to give you a better idea of what theory really is. So to do this, if we look at these this big jumble pile of Legos, and let's say that I had a bag here, and inside this bag I had a model like vehicle car or something, something that I've built out of Legos before. But I have this bag closed so that you can't see inside the bag, right? But what I do allow, what I'm going to allow you to do is put your hand inside the bag and kind of feel around and try to find that the, the, the Lego um, model car that I have there. And with only the touch of your hand, you kind of feel around and try to find where all, you know, how all the pieces fit together. Then I let you come back to the pile, and you have to rebuild what you felt inside the bag. Do you think you could do it? Okay, well, here's a quick video I'm going to have running kind of in the background of, uh, of this, of some students who do this, right? And then we'll look at their final, their final um, project. But as you're doing this, think about it, okay? So as you do this, it's like you kind of put something in, you try it out, and, oh, maybe that's not quite right. You maybe get another piece, oh, yeah, that feels kind of better, right, as, as you're going back and forth. And so you're doing this revising and revising and revising. And you do this over and over again until finally you think that you have a pretty good model of what it is. And so then you lay that down and you look at it. And let's say that not only you did this, but, but you know, a bunch of other students did this, and you all put your models down together. And let's say that you know, they end up kind of like they did in the video here, where you've got models that are similar. Maybe they have blocks that are similar, but maybe they were just different colors, right? But for the most part, there's a lot of similarities and a lot of different, and, and maybe a few differences here. But overall, if we look at all of the different models from all of these different students, we probably have a pretty good idea of what's going on inside that bag, right? Yeah, we may have a piece or two wrong. We may have a color wrong. And maybe right now, there's no way to know what color it could be, right? Because we can't look inside the bag. Well, this is really how science proceeds as well. Science happens like this, where we don't know what the truth is for sure. And it's particularly with evolution because evolution already happened and there's no way to travel back in time and see how it worked. But with all of the different evidences that we have and all of the different studies that we've done and all of the different scientific um, uh, um, experiments that we can perform in our current day, we can kind of get at what happened inside of that bag, inside of that evolutionary history bag. And we're not saying that the evolutionary theory is perfect. We don't know everything about it. There's lots of things that we're still trying to figure out. Like, for example, what is a species is still kind of one of these highly debated topics in evolution. But we know that species exist, and we know that species evolve. So there's things that we're really, really confident about, and there's things that we're still trying to modify. But that's what's great about a theory, is that a theory can be modified. It, as you go in, and you get more and more evidence, and more and more observations, and more and more 
um, facts and you and you start to see more and more laws starting to how they interact with each other you can make this overall model which we call the theory and the theory then gets better and better and better um, every once in a while a theory may be thrown out and a new theory may replace it but that doesn't happen actually very often now in, in science nowadays. Um, you know, things like flat earth, that was f f thrown out for uh, an earth that is round. And things like, you know, the sun, um, I mean, sorry, the, the sun orbiting around the earth was thrown out for the earth orbiting around the sun. So sometimes big changes are made, but for the most part, once you have a pretty good th theory, a pretty good model, you simply just make slight alterations to that based on new evidence that, that comes forward. And that's exactly what happened in these Lego models. So, so keep these things in mind as, as we go through, you know, um, competing ideas how to explain the phenomena that we see in this world around us and how to make sense of this world the best thing we can do is look at the competing models and choose those that are the best models and the best models are the ones that then we use to explain the world and evolutionary theory is our best model is our best explanation for the diversity of life on this planet